Miles and I just graduated recently and, you know, getting to read y'all's story and all of these incredible, like, nuggets of wisdom. I mean, like, this is all stuff that we think about, like, you know, try to remind ourselves of, but I think seeing it in this written form of a book and hearing it from y'all is just like, I mean, it's, it's incredibly inspiring just for us transitioning out of college into, you know, our careers. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. I mean, when I think about it, the book was never really meant to be a book until it had to be a book. Mm. So it's one of those things that, you know, this cat, Eli, you know, he'll downplay his whole role in this and I'm not going to let him. Um, <laughs> I say to every, and Eli knows this, every semester, and this past semester, I had 115 students. I had 80 undergrad and 35 grad students. And I say the same thing when I get started after the introductions and everything else, people trying to figure out, you know, when you go to class, trying to figure out the professor, you know, what is this guy about? Is he a slide reader? Is he like, you know, corny joke guy? Who the hell is this guy? Um, and I just said, listen, I'm going to tell a, I'm going to tell a story that hopefully takes the content of the class and put it into context that you can understand. I'm going to back that with my successes, failures, allegories, quotes, things that come to mind. And I said, it's very simple. If you hear me say something twice, you should write it down. It's important. And you'll probably see it again on the exam or some paper coming to you nearby. I say that to hundreds of students a year, literally. This cat, Mr. Eli here, listened and picked up a pen. Now, unbeknownst to me, for an entire semester, entire fall 2018 semester, this cat was capturing every word, non sequitur, quote, dad joke, whatever it is. He was capturing all of this stuff unbeknownst to me. So imagine wow. here you are showing up to work every day and you love what you do. So that, that's the biggest caveat. I love being Professor Odom. I absolutely love it. So I get to show up and be in a room with like the brightest, smartest, savviest people on Tuesdays and Fridays in the spring and the fall semester. I'm just doing my thing in the fall semester and just, da, 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 just doing my thing. This cat's capturing everything. And then at the end of this, in December, I want to give you this gift called Odom's Playbook. Wow. What are you supposed to do with that? What do you do when in a moment, after so many years of life, in a moment, someone through an extraordinary gesture has given you the gift of the proof of your impact and validated your experience and validated your existence for doing what you do. And by the way, doing what you do when it's not work. So somebody watched me at play, captured the salient moments, put it into a Word document, and handed it to me. Mm. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this? So completely blown away, and I sat on it. I didn't know what to do, and I thanked the gentleman, of course. But what do you do with that? Fast forward. It's now the end of 2020. Pandemic is racking people's families, wreaking havoc globally. I'm sitting at home like most people, going through my MacBook Pro saying, okay, if there's any file in here that's five years old, out, I'm getting rid of it. Because if I haven't opened it in five years, I don't need it. I got rid of a lot of stuff. But in that digging around, Odom's playbook comes up. I open it, start reading it again, immediately hit. And I'm like, where is this dude? So I went out on LinkedIn, at least I could find this. So I find him, there he is. I'm like, okay. I'd like to have a conversation with you about this book because in my mind i'm like this document this gift while immensely humbling and impactful to me it felt like in the moment that was the pen that is and was the pandemic it could help other people so me living as somebody who likes to pay it forward i thought about this book should this this document could become a book that paid forward could help other people so I reached out to Eli, I asked him to write the forward of the book. He took a week, came back, wrote, the, had written the forward, read the forward to me. And like, you know, no shame in my game, put me in tears sitting here like, I didn't know what to do with, first of all, you got the gift. And then this cat goes and writes a forward. that just like, further validates the validation. It's like, okay, this is just some shit. Okay, you got to be the co-author on the book. <laughs> Fuck it, we got to do it. We're going to do yeah, it. Yeah. And, and what you got is in your hand is 30 years worth of fuck it in your hand. Lots of stories, drama, stuff that I've learned. I'll tell you, I have fallen down and, and 
failed plenty. But it's in the failure that the learning actually happens. And um, I don't profess to be perfect or know it all. I just know my experience. And as one of the quotes in the book, you know what? They can challenge your research. They can challenge your opinion. They can challenge everything. But no one can challenge me to say, in my experience. How the hell are you going to challenge somebody when they say, in my experience? You weren't there. My experience is uniquely my own. And what I chose to do with Eli is to bring that experience to you gentlemen and ultimately to everybody who has read things I heard my professor say. Because I actually was the professor that said that shit. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. So Eli, in your experience, what made uh, this class with Dr. Odom so special? I mean, are you taking notes of everything every every professor ever said and giving them giving it to them at the end of the semester, right? Like what made what made this different? Yeah, so just let's get that right out there. It was the only time I've ever done this. No, no. I was worried. I was worried. I was like, wait, I thought, I thought I was special. Yeah, after this whole year of this journey, you find that I've been doing it the whole time. Yeah, no, that was that was perfectly said from his perspective, and I'm happy to kind of share it from from my side. But yeah. you know, just put yourself in my shoes. You you boys both just graduated, and I was going into my last semester as a senior and I didn't have a job lined up or anything. And we all have to take in business school at Northeastern, a class called organizational behavior. And with that, I had a couple of really, really close friends who said, you have to take this dude, Dr. Curtis Odom, you have to. And I'm looking and I'm like, the classes are only Tuesdays and Fridays. I went all of college without taking a class on Friday. I'm like, you're going to get me to break this streak at 930 on a Friday for this dude, Dr. Curtis Odom, like, I'm going to trust you guys, but <laughs> you're sticking your necks out, you know? So, yeah. and I just, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, I sit down on that first Friday and uh, he, you know, he walks in, he's got his bow tie on, his Red Sox cufflinks. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, who is he right now? Because freshers don't dress like that. And immediately <laughs> within five minutes, he starts just talking about, sharing his own life experiences, how he's going to put them out there. He's going to connect all the things he's teaching to what we've done in our lives and specifically the, the internships and the co-ops that we have at Northeastern of how you're going to be able to get the most out of this class. And then he comes with the biggest hit of all because he goes, I'm going to teach you about the game that's being played at every company, how to see it and how to succeed in it. And at this point, I'm sold. Like 15 minutes in, I just know like this dude is speaking my language about how to approach life, about how to approach work. And you can tell he's being honest, which I think at times we have a hard time seeing with professors of they have their own agendas and are they really here for us versus just teaching a class to get a paycheck. And mm -hmm. so I could just tell by his sincerity, his honesty, his openness. But when he said, I'm going to talk about playing the game, which is corporate life, corporate work, you know, how to, to you know, avoid the problems and the pitfalls. I was sold. I was immediately sold. And then his classic line about saying something twice, write it down. I mean, the professor literally just gave you the answers to the test. <laughs> you know, like, how do you not just, he says it twice. It's definitely important. I should write it down. And so, um, as I said, being a last semester senior with no job lined up, having all these bits of wisdom twice a week, just get thrown at you that, you know, you lead people, but you manage things, right? You get to define your own definition of success. And, and it's just these things that you don't hear. And I think that was the other thing too, is like, this is such a different way of approaching, you know, work that we've all been told and conditioned about for so long. And now I'm about to go out into the world. And here's this guy telling me all these incredible tidbits that I said, I have to take these down. And when they all are about negotiating and networking and leadership and management, um, you know, how do you not just want to sit there and listen and just absorb as much as you can? And at the end of all of it, I saw I have this massive document of 100, 150 quotes that were just absolutely, just absolutely awesome. And I'll never forget, I actually shared the document with like 30 of my friends. I hit them all up at the end of the semester. I'm like, what's your email? Like, I got to send this to you. And so then I remember I, I send it all out to him. I'm like, all right, I got to send it to Dr. Odom. And, uh, and yeah, it's just crazy the way life works. You know, two years later, he comes back to me asking about, you know, talking about this. And um, and that was a year ago, over a year ago now. Wow, last January, Professor. And, and you just sit here and I'm one of those people that I thought I'd have my life figured out from freshman year on of college. I knew what I was going to do and all those things. And 
the journey couldn't have been more different than it has. And this book has completely reshaped how I see my life and how I see my work that I'm doing impacting people around me. And I honestly just meeting you guys and kind of your appetite and your ambition to, to have this conversation to better yourselves, especially through reading. Like I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm a big book person. And now the fact that I get to see my name on a book with, with the, you know, this professor, I was starstruck when this guy reached out to me. If your favorite teacher you've ever had reaches out to you, says, I want to talk to you. I'm like, how do I, I didn't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> you know, that's like, <laughs> what, like, what do you do? And so I sit here now and I just, it, you know, he's a dear friend. He's my mentor and I'm just humbled to be around him, you know, whenever I can. But at the same time, he always says he's open to learning from us and, you know, and just sharing what we all can with each other. And, you know, the fact that we got to do this first book was an absolute just mind blowing experience, but uh, we're definitely excited to talk about the next book too, while we got you guys. So. Yeah, yeah. no, let's, uh, let's just get right into it right now. So, I mean, um, of course, things I heard my professor say, that's the first book. Um, what inspired the second book? What's the title? What, like, how did that come about? What was your feedback for the first yeah, one I'll, yeah uh, yeah yeah for sure yeah, keep so, going, yeah we're on the verge so we are really excited talking to you guys because this next book should be out within the next week or so and it's going to be called things i heard myself say insights oh. from a candid interview with yourself so we'll let that sink in for one second but <laughs> where did this all come from so incredible experience i know this was dr odom's fifth book that he put out things i heard my professor say we had all this great feedback, like you just said, Jan, you know, this, these great bits of wisdom and insights for young people trying to find their way in life and, and early career. And as we're all trying to figure out what the hell is going on, but really we started to, to see after several months, like, all right, there's a few things that we could have done differently that could have been more helpful to the reader to help them get the most out of this book. And as the year kind of progressed and we started getting onto more podcasts and we started doing more speaking engagements about, you know, things I heard my professor say, we saw what people found really valuable, but then we also saw just from feedback areas that we could add to it. And again, you know, myself and Professor Odom were business people. It's all about the customer and how can you help your customer, help your reader. And that was really the goal of the first book. Like he said, he wants to just pay it forward, just share this information that I found valuable, that he finds out, everybody finds valuable. But we wanted to make it more from a kind of you know theory application. All these quotes are really nice to an application where you, the reader, are going to draw the most from it possible. And so with that, we spent the last kind of months of 2020, the first few months of, of this year, really thinking about what do we want to do? What do we want to provide to the reader that's going to be most valuable to them in this career journey that they're on? And with that, that is how we got to things I heard myself say, which is ultimately a career journal based upon the 20 most impactful quotes from things I heard my professor say. But it actually opens up with prompts to every quote that are questions about you and your experiences in your career, in your life, and ultimately where you want to go. And that's how we kind of see this career journal is, look, quotes are great, but we want you, the reader, to get the most out of this, because that's going to ultimately help you find your most authentic self that maybe you didn't know before you saw some of these quotes. Again, great 100 quotes and things I heard my professor say, but we took the best quotes and we opened them up to you, the reader. We provide context to them to give you a sense of what they're really getting at. And we also have a table of contents so you can keep organized, you know, where you're at in the book, where you want to look to, what you want to understand about yourself, really. So with that, Dr. Odin, if there's more you want to throw on top of that. Yeah, no, great, great way of teeing that up. I mean, you know, I don't have a lot to add. Just what I would say is that, you know, being a business school professor, one of the things that is important is voice of the customer. You have to take into account what do people need? You know, the first four books that I wrote were all about what I wanted out into the universe. Things I heard my professor say, things I heard myself say, these two books are all about what the universe has told us that it needs. It's what people have said, hey, you know what? I need some help. I need a career journal that's created for me in, in collaboration with me to produce something that I'm gonna come back to. And as somebody who's been 
who's at the intersection. I've had 10 years of a military career, 10 years of a corporate career, 10 years of, and 10 years in, and ongoing as a business owner, which intersects being a professor. There are different stages in your career where the most important conversation you could have is with yourself to understand what do I want to do next? But more importantly, what do I not want to do next? And I think what happens, we talk about, Eli alluded to the game that I talk about when I have taught org behavior. I'm going to be direct. I'm talking to you, Jan. I'm talking to you, Miles. Corporate America was never built for you. It was never built for me. It was never built for people who look like us. That's just real talk. It's getting better. Things are changing. There are people of right mindset who are coming into positions of authority and influence that are making organizations more of a welcoming place to every aspect of diversity that anyone chooses to bring to the table. And as one of the quotes in the book talks about that, you know, the best organizations, the best leaders, and that the idea that people want to go to work and feel welcomed and valued to be able to contribute and be rewarded for those contributions and be their authentic self. There are more organizations that are becoming that way. But when I got started in my career, more organizations weren't that way. And when you think about it, how do you have a conversation with yourself, an authentic one, where you make the choice around what am I really willing to endure? What am I willing to sacrifice? What are my lessons learned? But to have a conversation with someone that quite frankly is willing to talk to you and meet you on the same level that you are. And there's no person that should be more ready to talk to you and meet you on the level that you're at than yourself. So this journal became that. How do you, how does Jan talk to himself and ask himself questions that quite frankly, only he would want to hear the answers to? Maybe they're not the answers you want to have out there in the wind. Maybe they're not the answers that a mentor or a coach or a family member or whomever would ask you that you would actually answer in the same way that you would answer yourself. And I think that's what's so powerful. This book that we are getting ready to launch, you know, wildly is the fact of have a conversation with yourself. Talk to yourself. Be willing to listen to your own answers and learn from those answers. I have students who come and see me every semester for office hours. And thematically, the questions are, you know, when did you know when you wanted, when you were doing what you wanted to do? How did you get into your career? What am I supposed to do with this degree that I never wanted to get, but my parents told me I had to get or else they weren't going to pay my tuition? I get to hear some shit. And I sit there and I talk to students who are actually, and I don't treat my, and Eli can attest this, I don't treat my students like students. I treat them like colleagues because that's what they are. These are the next, these are the next entrants to our workforce, to our generational workforce. So I don't treat them like children because they're not. It's the fact of like, listen, okay. You are a junior colleague to me. I've got to help get you ready for a workplace and a workforce that doesn't give a damn about you. They need you, but they're not interested in trying to do anything that's going to necessarily extend themselves too far into the space. So you've got to come ready. And the only way you can come ready is you got to know you. Every successful lead that I've ever worked with or I've ever coached or even a leader that I tried to be when I was leading a team of up to 70 people at one time. It starts with self-awareness. If you're not self-aware, then you can't self-manage. This is going back to the whole idea of emotional intelligence with Daniel Goleman. Goleman, if you break down emotional intelligence, it's four components. It's self-awareness leads to self-management. Self-management leads to social awareness and social awareness leads to relationship management. So you can't have good relationships. You can't show up well socially. You can't be seen as someone who can manage themselves unless you're self-aware. This book is about making you self-aware. This book is about you asking questions of yourself that you've wanted to ask, but have almost been afraid to. Or they're the questions you've asked yourself, but you've let them go unanswered because you're actually afraid to read or hear what you would say. Hence the title of the book. This book that we're getting ready to launch wildly could not have come into being without things I heard my professor say. So it's like out of one germinated the other. That's how it came to be. Wow. You all are saying such amazing information and knowledge and wisdom, but on a meta level, you all are such captivating 
speakers and and story and and storytellers. So I wanted to ask you all, like, in order to be a great story storyteller, you do have to have that knowledge of self. It is how you filter information and the experiences that have ha ha happened to you. Mm -hmm. To tell that story back means you have spent a lot of time processing those experiences. So I wanted to ask you all, what, as of now, in May of 2022, are you really trying to process and think and kind of form into a new or emerging story? Mm. Wow. Um, he's, he's basically asking, what's the third book? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> y'all processed a lot. So. I know, I know. He just, he just he gave a lot to you. So I just want to. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, but I would tell you, I think if, if there is to be a book that follows this, I would think that the, that the origin story of this next book, which I guess that would make it a trilogy of some sort. You got to go back to the voice of the customer. I would love to know down the road what the readers of things I heard myself say would say. What would they say once they've read this book and they've turned it into a career journal where they look at what stage in their career they're on and they dove into it and just, just became you know maniacal, just like filling out, answering these questions becoming self-aware at this career stage, realizing that where they find themselves right now, that's the best part about it. This book has shelf life, I believe. You're at one stage of your career. We've written this at, for five different stages of your career. You might be at this stage. You might be at this stage right now, and you're going to dive into this book, and you're going to become self-educated, self-aware, resilient, steadfast in who you are, and you're going to put it down. And you're going to go and next thing you know, you'll get to the next level of your career, or you might leave that job and go to another place and kind of restart. And you're going to go back and you're going to reach for this book because it's got shelf life. And you're going to see that these questions, we believe that the questions and the, the quotes, the prompts and the questions are timeless. Why are they timeless? Because they're based upon the stages that people find themselves in their career. So to answer your question, Miles, fully from my standpoint, I'd love Eli to jump in. Is that once we have had the opportunity to see the impact that things I heard my heard myself say have had, much like we did with things I heard my professor say, would be to go to those who are readers, and I would love to get testimony. How did this book, how did this career journal, more specifically, that you co-authored with us for yourself. What were you able to do because of this career journal that you co-authored for the written, for the reader, written in part by the reader? What did you do? You remember when we were growing up those stories? Maybe, I mean, I'm old, so maybe. But maybe those books were basically, you read it and say, if you want this type of ending, turn to page 35. And if you want to do this, turn to page 57. Well, when I was young, that was the rage. So like, you know, if you want to be the king of the castle, turn to page 57. You know, if you want to be, you know, Oh, dirt dog, turn to page 98, and you see what happens to you. Think about that applied to this book. A year later, we ask you, okay, you read the book, you took it to heart, you picked up a pen, where are you now? And now that you're there, what do you need? What do you wish you had? And then you know what? Give the people what they want. That's the true thing I think about authorship. That's why I think authorship is so inextricably linked to this idea of trying to pay it forward. Is if we were sitting around writing books that, that we wanted to read, we've got a finite audience. If you sit around and write books that people want to read, need to read, are better because they have read it and put it into actual action, oh man, that's what's powerful. And it's not about getting rich from the sales of the book. It's about getting rich from the impact of the book. That's the power. Don't need the money. Want the impact. That's what I want.
Eli, you you jump off up and I'm gonna sip on this bourbon cocktail. Catch my voice. <laughs> How do I follow that? Do you I don't know. Get on it. What do I say after that? <laughs> oh my god! You got man. it. You got it. You got it. Wow, wow, man. No, I I'm again. You can see why I'm honored to be in his presence. He does this just casually. He doesn't have a script. Like he he would come to class like without like notes. Like he was just going off the top of his brain. I, I was like, this dude's on on one on something whatever he's doing is working but they call that shit half crazy but that's all right it's all, it's all love <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean miles a fantastic question and you know i i would definitely just emulate dr odom what he's saying um i think at least from my own experience um i had the chance and kind of the origin of, of this new book and where it came from was I quit my job uh, at this company that I just couldn't stand. I couldn't stand the work I was doing, just what, what it was about. I, you know, it just wasn't for me. And this book comes along and I'm like, this is it. I have to see where this book goes, you know, this moment in my life. And so I had the chance to go out to Hawaii for a week and just get solitude, like just get away from New York, get away from my friends, my family, everything. Like I just needed time to, to process my, my life, my feelings, where I'm looking to go. And so I found this book called Burn After Writing, which served as a bit of inspiration. And Burn After Writing is basically a past, present, and future look at yourself. And it's, you know, from the, the topical of, you know, top five concerts in your life to what do you want your legacy to be? And so having this book, you know, kind of in this juncture of my life where I'm really trying to search for who I want to be and all these things, I said, well, we can take the best elements of this and apply it to what people want from things I heard my professor say. And hence things I heard myself say is this insight for yourself about all these things that maybe you've thought about, maybe you haven't, but you know, I, I wish I could tell you what it would look like, but if you asked me a year ago, what my life would look like now, I couldn't even come close. And so, you know, with that, I think he's, you know, Dr. Urban had spot on just the impact, just to hear people say, like, I'm thinking about something I never thought about before. I'm mm -hmm. seeing things in a way that I've, I've never seen them. And we've been conditioned a lot about a lot of things that aren't good for us over the last 25 years of our lives. Right. And so we've now been exposed in what the last five of how different the whole world can be for us. But just understanding that as Dr. Urban says, Looking in somebody else's mirror at what success should be for you will always fail, will always fail. That you need to figure out what your own definition of success is so that way you can wake up every single day feeling validated, feeling fulfilled, feeling you know successful about what you do day in and day out. And I think just to his hammer's point, if we could just hear what people want, hear what they, you know, what this helped them with and then how we take it to another level, how do we not respond to the call? So, yeah, you know, and on that conditioning point, I mean, that was the first thing that was clear to me when you're explaining things I heard myself say, which is that we are trained through every semester of school, right? Like you submit that paper, you take the test and you're basically saying like my, my sense of like effort, my performance on this is completely determined by someone else's grade, right? And I think by the time that I got to college, at least, I for sure uh, had, you know, an unhealthy kind of concern for professors' uh, approval, right, uh, authority figures' approval, and that was something that I think I had to unlearn, right, um, so I'm curious, you know, uh, it, it's clear that things I heard myself say is very much about kind of unlearning that and really honing in on what you yourself are saying, but for you too, specifically, in your experience, what, what is something that you had to unlearn or chose to unlearn and how'd you do it? Wow. Are you coming up with these questions off the top? Like, damn, these are great yes. questions. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, I love the fact you just said that for, for a couple of reasons. One, when students walk in, I, you know, I, I have now moved on actually enough, you know, the semester that I taught Eli was the last time I taught organizational behavior. I moved on, I now teach a course called Management Consulting and Organization. It's a capstone course um, for the management minor, uh, management major, I should say, and it actually spawned a consulting minor because the course is so hot. Um, and I have my students write a synthesis paper at the end of the semester. And I have them synthesize six of their 
previous courses and one of their co-op experiences and have them tell me how the learning in those six co those six classes one co-op contributed to their success in this class in terms of working with their team and working with the client so students walk into my classroom and they find three things in concert that they've not had through most of their time at northeastern acceptance autonomy and here's the other one that kills me is the fact of you know many of them have never had the opportunity to be authentic so when i tell them to write this paper they start asking me which format should it be should it be apa mla i'm like i don't give a shit pdq xyz i don't give a shit well do we need to create do we need to like cite the docket no i'm like i want you to tell me a story I said, I want you to tell me a story. And I call this famously a tea document in Boston, the trolley, the tea, you heard of it, the damn train, it goes all over town. I said, I call it a tea document. I basically want to get on the tea, watch you get off and see you have left behind your paper. I want to pick it up and read it. And from the first letter to the last letter, I want to be able to play, okay, damn, I get it. I know what this person learned how it impacted them, what they did with it, why it mattered, why it didn't matter, how some of the shit they learned wasn't worth shit. I want all of them. Tell me a story. Act like I'm Uncle Larry that comes to Thanksgiving dinner. And Uncle Larry says, what the hell you been learning for the past four years? Tell me something, young buck. And you got to tell them. That's what I want. And my students, their minds are blown. They've never had the autonomy to do that. They've never been given permission to be authentic. And they've never had the acceptance. So they struggle, not because they're not smart, it's because I have opened the cage, opened the door of the cage, and I'm telling the bird to fly out. The bird has never flown before. The bird, the bird is afraid to fly. Think about it. And they talk about, there's a quote, and I, you know, quotes are everything, that a bird born into captivity thinks that flying is an illness. Think about this. If you have never been able to fly, if you have never seen flight before and somebody gives it to you, you don't know what the hell to do with. So to answer your question, to what do you have to unlearn for me now at age 50 and having been out here for a while, what I have had to unlearn is simply this. No opinion matters more to, should matter more to you than your opinion of self. No opinion should matter more to you than your opinion of self. You need to get up in the morning, look at the mirror, and see whomever you want to see looking back at you. And if there's not an ability for you to do that, you've got to ask yourself why. Who is keeping you from seeing yourself being the person, the individual that you want to be? And I'll tell you the honest truth, most of the time, you're looking at the reason why you can't be who you need and want to be because you are not allowing yourself to be that person. That's what it is. Chills. Man. Okay, wait, just, just a quick follow, because I, I love to hear, Eli, your response. No, no, please, yeah, go away, go for it. You know, I, I'm curious uh, why you think it is that people don't allow themselves to be who they really want to be. You asking me or asking Eli? Oh, I'm asking you, Dr. Odom. Oh, okay. Well, off, yeah. off of what you just said. Why do I think it? Well, <laughs> I'm going to give you a multifaceted answer. One, it depends on where you are in your life. If I think about my contemporaries, we're all 50 years old. We are parents, mostly. We have been in relationships for a long period of time, mostly. Life has gotten into our head and it caused us to get in our own way. When you're 50 years old and you are working at a job that pays your bills, allows you to have a comfortable life, you cling to it, even if it's not doing what you ultimately want to be doing. Because at this page that we're on in life, I have less life ahead of me than I've lived. So 
except, except my own mortality. There it is. If I think about age, age 50, I'd like to say I'd leave, like live to age 85. I've got 35 years to make it count. My daughter's getting ready to go to college this fall. And when I think about that, I have it better than a lot of my contemporaries in the fact that I'm not smarter. No one gave me anything, I can assure you. It's just the fact that I was curious enough to ask those that I saw doing what it seemed like I wanted to do, two questions. And these two questions come, have you seen the movie Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith? Yeah. He's playing Chris Gardner. There's a line, there's a scene in that movie that fundamentally changed my life. And, and what I will tell you is that in the movie, and I'm paraphrasing from my memory, Chris Gardner in the, and Will Smith in the character of Chris Gardner is walking what, through what, to me, I remember it was like the stock market. And he's trying to sell the last one of those bone density scanners that he was say, selling to make money to feed his son. And he sees this cat, this dude drives up in his red Ferrari and parks in front of what looks like the stock exchange or some huge building. And in the movie, Chris Gardner walks up to the guy and says, wow, I just got two questions for you. What do you do and how do you do it? And in the movie, the guy says, I'm a stockbroker. Chris Gardner in the movie says, wow, I guess you got to be really good with math to do that or good with numbers. And he's like, no. He goes, you got to be pretty smart. He says, you got to be pretty smart for that. He's like, no. The guy says, so you got to be good with numbers. You got to be good with people. Think about that for a moment. If every person you know, including yourselves, was encouraged to say, listen, Find somebody who looks like they're doing what you want to be doing, or they're crushing it in a way that you want to be crushing it, or they're, they're not stressed. You see them just kind of floating through life, doing what they want to do. They're talking about things they get to do rather than shit they have to do. And ask that person, what do you do and how do you do it? And then shut up and just listen. Or pick up a pen and see what they have to say. And not because they're telling you what you need to do, but in this story, you may find inspiration. You may find the reason to change course. So to answer your question, what gets in the way of people doing that is I think quite frankly, because of fear, fear of failure, fear of going all in on themselves and figuring out that, you know what, what I wanted to do is gonna take more work than I thought. There are a lot of people who ask me all the time, well, how do you get there? Or I have my favorite thing, which actually to me is rather insulting. People are like, hey, you know, uh, I want to talk to you about how I get to that professor thing. Like that shit is easy. To be full-time faculty in a business school in Boston as a black man, I'm an anomaly. There are not many of us. And where I go, I bring others with me, if not literally, certainly figuratively. And you think about it, what it took to go into it. There's a lot of time, energy, money, resources, sacrifice, suffering that went into being Dr. Curtis Odom and certainly Professor Odom. But what was absent was the fear of going all in on myself. If I'm not willing to go all in on myself, what does that say about me? What does that say about my commitment to self? What does that say about my willingness to be successful? If I'm not really willing to lose everything, then I'm not really willing to gain anything. So fear. I've never been afraid. Why? Because at age 19, I was in Operation Desert Storm. And I learned what it meant to be afraid. And I can tell you, any shit else I've seen since then is ever going to make me as fearful as I was then. So I figure, you know what? When you spend a period of your time, months of your life, just praying you're going to wake up the next morning, when you do get a chance to wake up now, you, you're out of the rack. You can't wait to do shit. You can't wait. And then when what you love to do actually pays it forward to other people, what you do helps other people be successful. What you do informs their success. Oh, man, there's no better way to go. But to answer your question, what gets in the way? Fear. Man, if I had a whole class of, of this too, my, my mind would just be on a different <laughs> I'm like Eli right yeah. now. It's just like I know. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, though, uh, I want to I wanna ask you a very difficult question. Wait, hold on, hold on. He's got to answer my difficult question first. 
<laughs> oh yes, I guess, I guess. But I got a quick, I got a short version. He kind of took what I was gonna get out. Oh, but mine, sorry, put him on the spot. <laughs> Real quick, and then I, I got you, Miles. But you know, honestly, I think to that point, fear of failure is just the biggest thing, and fear of the unknown. And for me, my experience, I went to study abroad in Hong Kong when I was 20 years old, and I was in Bangkok by myself, not knowing the language, not knowing what the hell was happening. But I realized I was uncomfortable just inherently uncomfortable with everything happening around me, the sights, the smells, the sounds, the language. Mm. And I learned that being uncomfortable, once you can become comfortable with it, is one of the greatest assets you can have because then nothing throws you off, right? You can deal with any person then, you can deal with any situation because you know what it feels like to already be uncomfortable and how to manage yourself. But again, you have to put yourself out there. You have to experience things, you have to fail, you have to lose money, you have to, you know, suffer and, and do things that are going to suck but at the same time that investing of yourself and willing to take risks that are ultimately going to be the most beneficial for you especially for young people i think that's the most important way to view it so but anyway yeah miles let's let's do it with the, deal, the difficult question <laughs> so this is a question uh that you can answer in different gradients okay so when was a time that you disagreed with doc, Dr. Odom or some something that he said that was so counterintuitive that you thought it was wrong or something that you wanted to be untrue. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> wow, 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 wow. <laughs> so a time I disagreed with him, uh, a time I, he, Ooh. Something he said I wanted to be untrue, something that was so counterintuitive, I couldn't believe it at first. Exactly. Um, wow. Yeah. You know, to be all three. But no, but yeah, in that, in that vein, yeah, for sure. So yeah, I think just so you understand who I am, like I've been taught from a young age, you learn more by listening than by talking. And so I like to shut my mouth when I'm around smart people and hear what they have to say, a lot, all three of you. Um, but yeah, you know, I think probably the biggest one, and this comes during our, our creation of things I heard myself say, was we thought about, all right, what can we get out to the people? And really what we thought about doing was taking things I had my professor say, taking a template basically for every quote that we had in here, just saying, you know, when did you experience this? What happened? What would you do differently? And I sat and I thought and I thought and I thought for a week and I came back to Dr. Odom and I said, no, like this isn't good enough. Like this is not what people deserve. Like we are not fighting time. We have all the, the energy to make something that's really gonna help people. Um, was that Dr. Odom being super set in his ways on things? No, I don't think so. Um, and I'll say it's hard to push back on somebody who you revere that you know has so much wisdom but also at the same time is so aware of, you know, their blind spots, their weak points. And so, um, you know, I think probably the hardest thing in just trying to deal at points with Dr. Odom is how open he is to working with you when you don't think he's going to be that way with you. And, and that may not make sense at first when you hear it, but if you had somebody that you know has been through so much and has shared of how much they've been through, you can kind of think about where can I find these, you know, points that I can interject myself. And so I'll kind of this last wrap up example, but I just accepted a new job uh, with a company called Alpha Sites about two months ago, right after I, I met you guys. And before that, I was in the process of talking to another uh, university, actually, about doing fundraising or development work for them. And there came up a moment where I came to Dr. Odin and I said, look, the way it looks is going to be these two jobs are going to offer to me and I'm going to have to choose between the two of them. And one is, you know, a university that's all about opportunity. And that's what these books are about, right? Is giving people opportunity that they never saw before. And here's a university that's dedicated to doing that. And I can sit there all day and use my skills and talking to people and emotional intelligence to help get, you know, money to let kids go to college. Like what better purpose is that? But then this other opportunity comes along where I have the chance to become a manager in one year. I'm going to learn a bunch of skills, but the work isn't going to be as you know, meaningful. And so I shared this with Dr. Odom and, 
you know, he says to me, well, you know what you want, because I've been telling him for months that I wanted my work to be meaningful. I wanted my work to be purposeful. And so then, of course, that moment comes where I have to choose the two hard things and I don't, you know, I'm like, what do I really think? And what I said to Dr. Adams is I took the company that wasn't the university. I took this opportunity to become a manager in a year. And I said to Dr. Odom, I know you, what you told me. I compartmentalized it. But I thought about what are the skills I can learn right now in this job over the next year that I'm going to use to better myself and then ultimately better the people around me. And that was my thinking. And he actually taught me that. But I pushed back on him because of what he initially said to me. And uh, his response was just, it was just a thing of beauty. He goes, you've been listening. And, and once he said that, man, I was like, we're good. We're, we're good. But yeah, that's uh, a long-winded get to that answer, Miles. Yeah, yeah, that was a... No, so the way you brought it back, back to... <laughs> <laughs> wow no that sounds like jedi master to young padawan <laughs> <laughs> you have been listening <laughs> you are the listener now yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm> the <laughs> oh, you, know, had, you know i had a mentor i've had many but you know my greatest mentor said to me a long time ago before his passing is that my job is not to tell you what to do my job is to help you figure out what to do and the role of a mentor is supposed to be a thinking partner. That's what it's supposed to be. It's when Eli asked me if I would be his mentor, you know, that, that is a heavy ask and it's a heavy acceptance because when you accept and agree to be someone's mentor, you agree to help them think to help them arrive at a place that is for their betterment. And it is one of the most selfless things you can do because to be a mentor has to be nothing about you and all about the person. Now, granted, I get a lot from the relationship that I have with Eli. I mean, he's an amazing, you, Eli, an amazing, you know, friend and, you know, and counterpart. And we get to have some engaging conversations and we get to do some really cool shit as a result of it. But I have been part of many organizations, many things in my life where mentoring is less than that because the mentor was all about themselves. The mentor was into hearing themselves talk, hearing themselves speak um, and almost issuing edicts to their mentee of what needs to be done. That's not mentoring to me. Mentoring is, let me tell you the stories of my life and then find the allegory, find the, the, the moral of the story, use that to decide what you're going to do. Regardless of what he decided to do, I was gonna support it. But the reason why I said, ah, you've been listening is the fact of he had to answer that question for himself. He needed to weigh both opportunities in their entirety. And then as a nod to the book, be self-aware enough to know which of these two opportunities is really going to give me the opportunity to grow my knowledge, my skills, and my ability in a way that's going to allow me to take those things far into the future, not just for today. It's easy to go out and get a job for just for today, but it's harder to think about the job that I have today. What is it teaching me? What am I learning? Even if I hate the job, there are plenty of people who go to job every day, like co-op students I've had who go to their co-op and they hate their co-op. But I asked them, I said, okay, you hated it, it sucked. Well, what did you learn? And they're like, no one's asked me that question before. Ah, good. So come back with an answer when you're ready. And that messes people up because when you ask them a question that they've never been asked before, they don't know what to do with that. Because they're at that place of trying to decide, do I tell this dude what I think he wants to hear or do I answer honestly? The book is about answering honestly, just like my class. Don't write a paper that you think I want to read. Write the paper that you've been dying in your soul to write and let me read it. Different. It's different. 
Yeah, Doc, talk, talk, Dr. Odom, um, I, I wanted to ask, ask you, and given what you were saying about how various places where you've worked, mentorship, you know, hasn't been uh, val value. And of all the teams that you've worked on, you know, from the Navy to the corporate world to now in the academic world, mm -hmm. what was the most effective team that you worked worked on, and what was the most dysfunctional team, and what were the most salient attrib uh, attributes of both of them? I will not use company names to protect the guilty. How about that? <laughs> um, but I will say this. The best team I've ever worked on, uh, both examples are when I was in, in my 10-year corporate sprint. As I call it a sprint. But because I've moved through so many different companies, always growing in levels of responsibility and seniority. It's funny, you know, out of my now, you know, 50 years of being alive and 30 some odd years of, of, of career, I've only been promoted twice, once when I was in the Navy and just recently promoted at Northeastern um, from one from assistant teacher professor to associate. In between times, I always moved for my promotion. Nobody ever came and knighted me, if you will. I moved on. The best team I worked on, and I'll use the years because if people who I know are part of that team are listening, they'll be able to figure it out. So the years 2005 to 2006, I had the opportunity to work on the best team I ever worked on because we were both a team that was focused on cooperation and collaboration. Cooperation in the fact that each one of us owned a certain set of responsibilities. Collaboration in the fact that none of us would be successful without also making sure that the other members of the team were also equally successful. So you couldn't be a superstar and watch your colleagues fail. It had to be the high tide would rise all boats. And the reason why that happened is the person that we were working for in that time, they, and I'm using um, non-gender specific pronouns, not to give it away, but they were someone that we worked for who never made us feel like we worked for them, but that we always worked with them. And because we felt like we worked with them, we gave our best. And we were all in on trying to be successful for ourselves, because our success turned into success for our colleagues. And it allowed all of us to kind of move through that working space like a Spike Lee movie. See the Spike Lee movie where the, where the characters just glide and everything's moving behind them? Yeah. That's how I felt. Because we were so into what we were doing. We were clicking and sticking. Everybody was doing their thing. We were getting all the accolades. Things were popping. People were getting raises. Everything was great. It was amazing. Now, the converse. I was in a place where I first got introduced to the game. When I first realized the fact that while I was there, there were more people that did not want me there than wanted me there. I walked into an opportunity to lead in a space where the people who were my direct reports all felt like they were better qualified for the job I was holding than I was. There were people who felt like they were entitled to the job that I had just been hired into, but were not. I walked into an environment that while well qualified and credentialed to be there, I was not wanted. I was not welcome. I was not valued. My, contrib my contributions were marginalized and demeaned because others wanted to show themselves to be of a certain caliber or whatever. And I was not allowed to be my authentic self because my authentic self was seen as, in a word, just I guess you I guess you could say just it's not even words, more of a phrase. I was just a little bit too much. I'll put it that way. I was a little bit too much. When you're a six foot tall, heavy set, bald black dude who spent 10 years in the military, has a doctoral degree, knows what he's talking about with the type of voice that I have and the slightly irreverent humor based upon trying to have fun with life. 
I don't fit the mold of someone who looks like they just jumped off the cover of a J. Crew magazine. So that's not me. That's never gonna be me. And I'm not going to kill myself trying to force myself into it. Like those actors, you see them one way, then they get famous, they're like half their size and they look like a Pez dispenser because they got this big ass head and a little body because they turn themselves into somebody who they're not. That was never gonna be me. And I had to decide, do I wanna try to stay somewhere and, be, and unbecome myself to hope to succeed? Or do I leave and embrace who I am fully and chase after success by my own hand? And I decided to do that. And it's because I was on a team that was completely not built for me, that was dysfunctional, where I literally felt that I was walking on eggshells, where I felt that everything that was gonna come out of my mouth was open to ridicule and inspection. I was like, you know what? No. And as I told one of my good friends, I'm like, how do I go from being a rock star before I get to this place to being a shit bird now? What happened? What did I do different? It's just a fact of gentlemen, there are places in the world that need you, but they're not ready for you. They need who you are. They need what you bring to the table, but they're not ready for you. They don't know what to do with that. So because they don't know what to do with it, they've got to ostracize it. They've got to push it away. They've got to do things to help you to minimize, or should I say minimize and demoralize yourself so that you will be less than who you are because less than who you are is what they're set up to deal with. That's the challenge. So those are the two instances. And, you know, I, um, you know, a lot of the things that were in things I heard my professor say are based upon those lessons that I learned. Personal, in my experience, lessons. Mm, wow. Uh, that, that was, those were some incredible stories. And uh, in particular on that last point that there are places that need you but aren't ready for you. Uh, I definitely received that because it's it reminds me immediately of Batman. You know, you just called us Batman out here. I really appreciate that for real. Mm -hmm. um, the, you, you know what I'm talking about, right, Dr. Odom? <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> the I, got <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and it's it's true. It's the fact of, you know what? It's like not unlike that is the fact of. What I have experienced to go along with that is you had to be top notch to be able to be considered for the opportunity. But then when you get there and you bring the entire person, it's the entire person and they're not ready for it. It's easy to read the credentials. It's easy to read the resume. It's easy to navigate the, or easy, I would say in a way to navigate interviews. But then after about six months, the real, person shows up as well as it, at six months does the organization reveal itself to you. And what you often find after the six month, six month mark is there's some incongruence where you are as the employee who've been recently hired say to yourself, you know what, this is not the company that I thought that I joined. But at the same time, realize the company it might be saying at that six month point, that's not the person that we thought that we hired. It doesn't happen all the time, but for me, my last corporate spot, that's exactly what happened. At six months, I'm like, okay, I need to get the bug out of here. And um, I made that happen. And I have not looked back. I have not regretted that decision. Um, everything that has happened after that has been a direct result of the relationships that I made during that time, have been a, relation, have been a result of the self-awareness that I got at that time. So even though it might not have ended the way that at that time I would have wanted it to, now sitting here 11 years removed, it ended perfectly. It ended perfectly because it made me who I am. So for that, I'm grateful. Mm. That's incredible. Um, one of my uh, favorite principles or, or laws that the two of you definitely know is the Pareto principle, the 80-20 law. And, you know, given who, who you all both, both are, I, I wanted to ask you all, what is 
your big 80 20 action like in, in your own lives like what is the the thing that takes 20 per percent of your time that has 80 per percent of the impact what is the small thing that makes the really big change Eli, that's on you to answer this one. Man. I've been talking for a while. <laughs> I'll be honest, I've been enjoying this. I feel like I'm in the audience with these guys listening. <laughs> no, this is fucking awesome. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely, it's just a great question, Miles, again, and I thank you for it. Um, yeah, you know, I feel like the big thing that really helps me click, that helps me just be who I am, uh, is self care and like self management. And so, to that 20% of the time for me, that's going to yoga a couple of times a week. That's meditating, you know, a couple of minutes a day that's working out. That's, you know, giving myself like alone time because that's just what I need to recharge. Like I love being social. I love all my friends. I love the people in my life, but at the same time to be my best version of myself, I need that couple hours a week to just be alone, be with myself. Um, and so I look at it as like the hour or two before work, is for Eli and nobody else. I wake up early, I go to the gym, I get to listen to my music, I get to think through my day, think through things that are happening in my life. And by just being aware of myself and by just accounting for all the stuff happening, it kind of without outside interruption, I'm able to keep clear sight on everything that I'm doing. And just having that direction, having the focus helps me maintain my energy, helps me maintain um, maintain just kind of my my, drive for what I'm looking to do because I don't feel like I'm pulled apart in a trillion different directions. I know, you know, I want to focus on this book. I want to do well on my job and I want to have a, a strong social life with my friends, but you have to be intentional. That's the biggest thing, you know? So I'm, I'm curious what you guys do, what your 80, 20 split looks like. We've been here talking all day. I want to hear about you guys, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was in this loud, dark party talking to you oh, guys. <laughs> No, that's so, so, so that's a great answer though, Eli. Um, it reminds me of the uh, truism and things I heard my professor say that like, you must be selfish to yeah. be success, success, successful, you know? And I don't think folks want to hear that word selfish, but like, I have personally felt too that I have been overly gener generous with, with my time. Yeah. And, you know, just making, making space for, for friends, running errands and going out all, all, all this Jen and I have been talking a lot about in the last couple of months, we've started to scale back on it because we need to good. Good. re-energize with things that we care about. Like this podcast is one of those things that we wanted to be selfish about. We were, we were like, yeah. we love talking about books on our own like why are we not creating the space to do this more like we want to keep spending time doing this this is us being selfish right so that was just one of the big points from uh your your yeah. book but uh my own 80 20 action i would have to say is reading you know not not to nice. talk about a thing that doesn't really need to be explained but like i think less and less uh, with work, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come back home from work and just want to like, be on my phone. And I think, you know, just scrolling, scrolling through like so, 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 social media and, and, and Twitter, you, you kind of want to breathe, but it's just a really bad way to do that and to yeah, waste yeah. that time. Yeah. Uh, and I just have made sure that every day I'm coming back to reading. And the, the thing about reading is it's the quintessence of like single ta tasking. It's like keeping your mind focused on one word at a time, one sentence, one paragraph, one yeah. book. Like it, it's the antithesis of the inter inter internet in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just kind of puts me back into that 1% growth mind mindset of like, this is a, a small thing, even reading a couple of pages that that makes my day so so much better and makes me smarter and better able to connect with others so mm -hmm. reading it is really my thing and kids right and, and given the amount of time and the split like i don't think i i'm really reading for more than one two hours a day but that that's such a critical critical time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 
And I mean, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Just so you like to read that much, you're, you're in the fourth percentile of people, you're 96 percentile, like nobody's doing that. Um, But I think in that same vein, like that word selfish gets used like to be your best self, that best self is the one that's most helpful to society, the best friend to your friends, like the best son to your parents, like nobody wants to like, that's the next level of the selfishness is your best self makes everything better versus being tired and drawn out and and not who you can be. But Mm -hmm. kudos to you, dude. That's a ton of reading. I'm fucking way behind you. So. at all yeah no i think i I think that um on the same tip i mean miles and i talk about all the time how the way that we learned the uh supposed alleged opposition between self and everyone else or like self and society um is a total illusion right like uh us just following our curiosity and really honing in on what we care about what we want to learn more on um, like, like through this podcast, um, extends to all these people that we may or may not even know, um, but could benefit from the show. Right. And so I think just realizing all of the ways that our own personal well-being aligns with the well-being of all of our relationships, everyone that we're connected to and everyone that they're connected to. I mean, it's really like exponential, right? Just the influence that every individual has through all the people that they interact with on a given day. Um, so yeah, I mean, the podcast for sure is definitely uh, one of those 80-20 things, reading for sure. Um, I think another one that's really important for me is walking, um, going on walks. I think even with reading, it's really easy for me to get into like, oh, I'm going to do something productive right now. So let me like read. And mm. I think it's it's way, way easier to convince myself that like going on a walk right now wouldn't be productive right um but inevitably it is the walk that surprises me and in in ways that I could have never anticipated right I think um reading has been critical for exercising that ability to choose like what I want to learn about what I want to focus on um but I think that there's something even not not more powerful but just powerful in a different way about walking or exercising where it's like choosing to let yourself go and like go into a flow um because yeah it's incredible the kinds of like realizations um I think one can have when you're like on a walk especially when you know you're not like on your phone or anything you're just kind of taking in the world breathing uh really turning it into kind of like a walking meditation in that sense um and that's something that I I wish I did more of honestly I think I was I was going on a lot of work walks during the pandemic just because of uh, virtual learning. Like I hated being inside in class for like four to six hours a day. So I, I would just, I would just go outside and just be outside for like three hours. Um, and, you know, I'd love to continue that practice um, because it is one of those things that uh, a little bit every day um, can go a long way in the long run. Um, I think, um, I think- to spice it up a little bit though, with the possible inverse. Uh, I, I, I think the wild, the wild card for, for me in, in terms of this 80, 80, 20 rule is music. And that music can be that thing that gives 80% positive energy or negative. And Jan was honest, honest, honestly, my uh, big influence in terms of this, cause he was like, yeah, like I realized I was playing a lot of the same music that was keeping me sad. And it wasn't until, you know, I started getting into, you know, Afro beats, reggae, that I started to be happier more of the time. Like when when I'm in my, you know, dark days of, of like the winter feeling really single, you know, I should not be playing Drake. <laughs> Killer. like that, that that is not gonna feeling help. single feeling really single yeah, that is not gonna help my emotional state right so it's like what and and then how how that looks on a daily is making sure right i'm not getting into those habits of music that again just depress me so that's that's one yeah no that that's definitely true music music is a incredible amplifier um mm, yeah and 
and you know it's a it's a mirror in its own way right the ways in which you can kind of like understand how you're feeling or how you want to feel based off of what you're listening to um it's definitely like music is the way that i've learned emotional intelligence um but i think like you know to take a to take a a quote actually from from your book um your your career success depends on having advocates what is an advocate a person of influence who will say good things about you and your abilities when you are not around to hear them at a critical moment. Um, that, that one really hit deep for me because I know it's true, uh, even with my job at Georgetown now, the importance of advocates. Um, but now talking about this with you all, I actually think that there is uh, an importance of being an advocate for yourself as well. And I think that's where the selfishness really does come in is, is being able to advocate for what you really want. That's what it means to be honest and communicate openly with the people around you. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe that's, you can't obviously like advocate for yourself when you're not there in the same way that a influential person could in that right critical moment. But I think there's definitely something you said for, you know, putting your best foot forward and just being like, hey, like, this is what I want to do. I'm not interested in this. And just like being confident in that. I, I think that's true. And there are many ways that you can advocate for yourself and i will tell you that you know one of the things that i found and it took me a while to get here is that i was not able to really advocate for myself until i got to the place where i could say no to people's requests of my time when i first started my business it was you know all about trying to find the next contract and the next what have you trying to find the next invoice what have you so there were times where very simply, if you weren't working, you weren't earning. And if you weren't doing something, you weren't generating revenue. So part of the 80-20, just to kind of link back to what you're asking, you know, and this might sound horrible, but allow me to qualify what I'm going to say. The 20% that fuels it is the 20% I spend with my wife and my daughter. My wife works full time. I'm full time all over the place. My, my daughter's a senior in high school. We're always like, okay, ready, break. Pew, everybody scattered. Sunday morning is a time where there's no real computer usage. There's no texting. There's no internet. We get a chance to sit and chill. We get to have Sunday breakfast. We get to watch what I think is the greatest show on TV, which is CBS Sunday morning, where you get a chance to learn things that you didn't know and we have discussions around those things that we learn and we talk about things you know and just like today's show was just like fascinating of course it starts off with what's in the headlines but like the cover story was and i'm just pulling it from the, the site it's like the cover story is paths to avoiding crippling student debt we talked about that as a daughter who's about to go to go to college that's important they did a history lesson on abraham lincoln's coat and the hidden bloody stories that surrounded that they talked to Michael Che from Saturday Night Live fame and talked about his journey and how he got to where he is. So you get to learn about somebody. They do something in passage every week, which is letting you know who passed away this week that you might not have even known. They did a story on Jose Andres, who's doing the you know, operating in a war zone with his World Central Kitchen. Um, they talked to Rita Braver. This is a woman who'd been with CBS for 50 years and her story. And then they finished it off by talking with Lionel Richie on his journey as he's getting ready to receive an award by the Library of Congress. And they finish it off by talking to this dude, Garrison Keeler, who's all before all of our times, but somebody who brought a lot to the table. And it's just like, okay, as a family, we get to sit there and digest these things to talk about. So in that space, that 20% of the week, I look forward to that Sunday and to being able to sit and chill and have that conversation and, and enjoy you know, that moment with one another, you know, as a springboard to all of that, it's like, you know what, for me, when I think about all the different things that I have going on, and I'm grateful for all of them, those 20 minutes remind me of why I do what I do. Why do I go after the things I go after? I get a chance to consult, I get a chance to teach, I'm an executive coach, you know, I get a chance to write for Forbes. I get a chance to, to write for Sloan Management Review. I get to do podcasts with you gentlemen. I get to speak. I get to do all these other things. Why? 
number one, because I do all those things, it's not about me. None of the things that I'm doing are about me. They benefit me, but I'm not doing them for me. I'm doing them because it allows me to have an impact. Now, those impacts, those, those streams pay me well, but that's great. But I don't do anything just because of the loop. So because I left behind that idea of I've got to do this because I get money to do it, and that's the only reason why I'm doing it, those days are gone. I just get a chance to enjoy being who I am and, you know, having the opportunity to be reminded, if not every day, but specifically on Sundays, of why I do what I do. Where do I take joy? Where do I get excitement from that? You're right. Being selfish is tough. I mean, I'm in a place right now. I mean, my daughter's graduated from high school. We're going to take a two-week family vacation. We've never done that before. And I have front loaded my calendar to be able to make sure I need to do everything I need to do for my consulting firm. The semester's over at Northeastern. I don't have to worry about that. I've alerted my executive coaching clients. Look, don't look for me from, Jan from June 15th to July 5th. Not around. Just not around. You're going to get hella out of office. You're going to get, you know, skulls and crossbones. You're going to get all type of shit. Don't look for me. I'm not around. But I feel guilty. I feel guilty that I'm taking this amount of time for myself. Not because I don't deserve it, but because I've never done it before. I've never done it before. And it's like, you know what? I deserve to be able to just disappear for two weeks and just go do what I want to do with my family. The world existed fine before I got here. It's going to be fine after I leave. These two weeks ain't shit. But when you're used to every day you have to get up and you need to do what your calling, what your purpose dictates. When you say, you know what, I'm gonna take two weeks off. Once upon a time, I couldn't even fathom that. Because taking two weeks off was like, you know, the bank account would be like, you know, crying and saying prayers to try to make it through. But now when you say, listen, I'm gonna take two weeks off, you know what? Bread's still popping up like a toaster. <laughs> okay, good. I'm still paid, I'm off, but I'm still paid, okay. When you can go on vacation or you get to that place where, you know, I never wanted to be rich. I just wanted to have enough. Where I didn't have to worry about, do I have enough to pay the mortgage? Do I have enough to pay the car note? Do I have enough to send my daughter to school? Do I have enough? I have enough. Enough doesn't have a number on it. I just have enough. That's all I ever wanted. So now I'm committed to help other people find their enough. What's your enough? What is enough? What is enough education, enough money? enough fame, enough notoriety, enough love, enough success, enough. I want you to find your enough. I found mine. So why should I try to help other people find theirs? That's how it's supposed to be. And in that way, I'm kind of a mentor to more than just one. I just do my thing in a way, you know what? I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to show you what I did. And hopefully you take some inspiration from that and it allows you to be successful in your mirror and by your own definition. Wow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why uh, you made me think of this story. Uh, a couple of years ago, Jan was reading this book called The Cal Calendar of Wisdom by Leo Tol 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 Tolstoy. Tolstoy, yeah, yeah. Tol 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 Tolstoy had written, you know, obviously, all these huge fam famous books but he says that a calendar of wisdom is the most important book he ever wrote and it was just a book of quotes that he had amassed from all all of his time writing and you know mm -hmm. the way that you talk about things i, I heard my pr professor say and just being a mentor to, to so to, to so many you see the parallel the parallels there um, mm -hmm. so there's a quote that I was reminded of this week. It says, we're not free unless we're able to say no by Alexander de Haier. And you think about that. How many times do you actually get to say no? I was talking to some folks this week, you know, my contemporaries who have to do. They got to do mm -hmm. stuff. They can't say no. Me, if somebody reaches out to me, hey, I want to do this. Like, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not available. I might be available as all hell. I just don't want to do that shit. But I have the ability to say, no, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Or no, I'm not available. Because that's part of my self-care. I don't want to be overextended. 
I don't want to try to put myself in places where because I have overburdened or overtaxed myself that I then have to show up as less than being my authentic self. Because that's not good to anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, and it go, it's the antithesis of what I believe in. I'd rather be, I'd rather have fewer things that I get to show up and be 100% bought into like this moment with you gentlemen as opposed to running around between four or five different things and at each place giving a fraction of who I am rather than the whole of my knowledge, skill, and ability. Before uh, you guys say anything else, Jan, there's this book that I came across that it's called Bored and Brilliant. And it's all about how spacing out can unlock your most productive and creative self. I saw like her TED talk on it. I was like, I got to get this book. I haven't read uh, it yet, but just based upon exactly what you said about taking those walks and just letting your brain recharge and just, I was like, I got to share this with you, man. Bored and brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, no, I, Eli, I was about to ask if you had any um, uh, <laughs> non, non things, non quotes from you and uh, Dr. Odom that you really uh, oh. are inspired by. Dude, I have um, so many. I have a whole yeah, yeah. So, of so, these quotes, man. Yeah, no, go ahead, no, go uh, ahead, share, share a few, uh, and then I, we'd love to hear like uh, y'all's like favorite books, other book recs, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, whew, there's a ton of them, but uh, yeah, definitely just like where three, where some of these quotes come from. Uh, it's called Eleven Rings: The Soul of Success by Phil Jackson. If you, if you guys have not come across that book, that book is awesome. Just so it's like his autobiography, but. Any dude that could coach Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan and get them to take less shots, I'm like, I want to know what he did, you know, for the good of the team, right? So solo success is up there. Uh, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. I put Dr. Odom onto that book. That book is also autobiographical, but just full of life, wisdom, and and nuggets of just uh, self-reflection, introspection. Um, and I just finished a few weeks ago, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, if you're familiar with that. Um, you know, they're just those books that as you go through them, you're just getting your mind blown every couple of pages. And so, um, you know, probably one of my favorites that I've just been thinking about, I actually watched the movie Dune the other night uh, with Sarah, I guys have seen that movie, but there's a quote and it's from uh, the famous philosopher, Alan Watts, life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. And at first, people might not want to hear that, right? There's obviously a lot of problems in this world, and you know we got to do our best to tell you it's not about ignoring the problems, but it's about finding your place in this life and figuring out where you can do your part, right? Because anybody trying to take off you know, a million things and change everything and fix it all, ineffective, to Dr. Adams' point, right? Like finding that one thing that you really want to set your life to, set your ambitions to, um, you know, I'm super for. And so I, I think that quote to me just... I can't get past um, Phil Jackson's quote, probably the other big one. The so, like the soul of success is basically doing everything you can to set yourself up for success and then letting go of like when the game starts, right? Like letting go of the outcome because you can't control that, right? There's so much in life that we want to control. We want to influence, but I think so much of my joy in life comes from just going with the flow and accepting what is and, you know, there's some things that are good some things that are bad a friend likes to say this too shall pass right and so there's are some of the top ones but soul success by phil jackson green lights by mcconaughey and and frankel's man search for meaning are just top tier books i can't recommend them enough let's go let's go thank you for those information yes. that's good stuff um i have a couple one that one that i've been you know that i basically read every year over and over not because i forget what's in the book but every time i read it i learn a little bit more i don't keep it far i keep it close and it's this book it's called the one thing by these two gentlemen gary keller and jay papasan it's called the one thing the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary results and there's a lot in this book but i will tell you that the ultimate premise of the book is that if you ever heard the expression or the phrase multitasking, that was never meant to be applied to people. Multitasking is with the dawn of the supercomputer that people would look at a computer doing tasks so quick and so fast to the naked eye, it looked like it was doing two things at one time, hence the name multitasking. People are never meant to multitask. 
computers multitask because they're basically, if you, you know, be too much of a geek, they're all ones and zeros. It's on and off, on and off, on and off. If you do it fast enough to the naked eye, of course, it looks like it's happening at the same time. It's kind of like trying to watch a hummingbird's wings, seeing the individual flaps. You can't do it too fast. You can't catch it. We, stupidly, I would say, as people try to apply something that was never a humanistic skill to a humanistic means, which is saying that people multitask. No, when you multitask, as you try to do more and more things outside of the one thing, you start to get to a place where you diminish your impact and those other things that you're having. So this book talks about the idea of focusing on the one thing that you need to be doing right now that sets everything else up. And can you focus on this one thing? And if that is whatever that one thing is, come back to it and say, okay, if I do this, what does that set me up for? That, that's one thing that I think is, is fantastic and allows you to keep moving forward. So that's a book that I recommend highly. Second book is something that a friend gave to me a few years ago. Um, and the title of the book is The Go-Giver. And what I love about this book, I'm just gonna bring the, the description up. Yeah, it's called The Go-Giver, a little story about a powerful business idea. And the whole idea for that is that the go-giver tells you that there's a classic line, if you've ever heard, givers get. The more you give, the more you get. The story of the go-giver is of a story of this young guy who yearns to be successful, but is doing everything based upon what he can get. He's doing everything based upon what he can get rather than what he can give. And his mentor tells him that if you really want to be successful, invest in other people's success first. And investing in other people's success and then being successful returns things to you that are incalculable, things that you, that you can't imagine that could come back to you, um, which is fascinating. And I think, you know, the third book that has been instrumental to my life uh, is a book called Million Dollar Consulting by a gentleman named Alan Weiss. When I first got out on my own, I was trying to think about this. Alan Weiss, that book, and I think it was like in his fifth edition when I got it. You know, the idea of million dollar consulting is not about million dollars, like how to make a million bucks. It's more about the fact of how do you build something that eventually could be valued for that. And his premise was that you write. Writing gives you the opportunity to speak. Speaking gives you the opportunity to consult and consulting gives you the opportunity to have impact. And, and that's exactly it. So that's why I spend so much time writing because it gives me opportunities to speak. Others hear what I have to say and then they invite me to come and help them be a thinking partner to solving problems and away it goes. Whether that's in my classroom, whether it's with consulting clients, whether that's as an executive coach, there are a lot of things that impact me in the standpoint of ultimately how do you find where you are and realize and, and understand and discover how you get to where you want to be and ultimately realize that everything we learn, we learn from someone else. Everything that we do is because someone gave us either counsel or advice or support or love, whatever it is. None of us gets anywhere all by ourselves. Only the fool believes that to be true. So even when people say, oh, I'm self-made, I hate that expression because you're not, you're not. None of us is self-made, none of us. That, that would be implied, we birthed ourselves, we grew ourselves, we've done everything. Just think about that, uh. that just sounds stupid. <laughs> it sounds stupid. It's stupid, you're not self-made. You might be self-actualized, you might be self-motivated, you might be self-aware, you might be self-managing, but you are not self-made. You are made based upon all the input and all of the help, and all the love you've gotten from everybody else around you. So to say you're self-made is actually to be insulting to everybody who helped you be who you are right now. Mm. So this is stuff that just floats around in my head, gentlemen. I, you know, he, he does this shit casually. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, this, is, this has been such a, a gift of a podcast. Honestly, we're like 32 episodes in, and this is already at the top of my mind. It's like one of my favorite Damn. experiences. Seriously, thank you. So, just so yeah. grateful to you both for for coming on. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely appreciate your presence here with us today. Sarah, if you're listening, <laughs> yeah. shout out to Sarah Doe, making uh, this all you know. possible. Yeah, yeah big uh, shout out. Big shout out. Yeah, exactly. We love you. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Uh, can't wait to see you very soon at the reunion. Hopefully, you know. But uh, yeah, quick, quick <laughs> yeah. shout out, Sarah. Yeah, I'll exactly. see you guys there too. I, oh, yeah, exactly. I got, <laughs> I got the invite, so I'll, yeah, I'll exactly. be able to uh, thank you guys in person. So yeah, yeah, seriously. But, yeah, no, seriously, yeah. This, this has been an absolute just like a joy, man. This we've done five, six podcasts at this point, but this has just been. Uh, this has been my favorite of them all. But wow, yeah. your, just, your questions. Here, Gentlemen, yeah, your you guys wow. killed it, man. Seriously, question, your questions are, um, you know, you did some, you did something I don't get a chance to do often, but I love when I do. Is you gave me a chance to pause before I answered, mm. and that that is based upon the strength of your question. Um, I didn't have to think about how I was going to answer. It's just the fact I let the question hit me. Mm -hmm. um, before I did, because they're questions that I had not been asked before. Oddly enough, just like the book is going to be doing for everybody who picks up a copy of it.